We also heard great examples and case studies of possible solutions and recommendations to move these efforts forward. The discussions were enriched by the valuable comments from the participants as well, and we definitely look forward to your active participation today. Thank you again for joining us and investing your valuable time to share your experience in today's session, the last on, the, on this Learning Week series. Today's session is on Pandemic as Disaster, Lessons for DRR Planning, Protection and Vulnerability. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a protracted and complex emergency that has tested response systems around the globe. Now into the second year of learning, disrupted by extended closures, it is an extreme example of the various ways children's education is affected when disaster hits, including the inequality and the vulnerability gaps that widen. Identifying critical learning points from COVID-19's unique impact may be vital for also preparing and preparing for and increasing resilience to the increasing rising um, incidence of catastrophic events in the future. If you missed any of the previous sessions, they will be available on Crown Agent's YouTube channel in a few days. Now, today, to begin the session, I would like to invite Leela Mulukutla, team lead for the Nepal Safer Schools project, to welcome our participants and set the stage uh, now. Welcome, Leela. May I invite you for your welcome remarks? Oh, sorry, I think I was muted. Thank you so much, Kanchan, for that uh, introduction. It was super. Um, and thanks to everyone who is participating today. It's great to see so many people uh, here for this discussion, which I think is going to be interesting and important and a great roundup uh, to our week of learning sessions. So the Nepal Safe for Schools project was conceptualized to support schools and communities in implementing the government of Nepal's vision for comprehensive school safety. Elements of the government's comprehensive school safety plans look to improve inclusion for instance, by appointing Jesse focal teachers in school or having a school planning process that can ideally be used to identify and, and address inclusion challenges and instituting systems such as complaint response mechanisms in schools. As a project, we also tried hard to make sure that inclusion was an integral part of our work. Marginalization indicators were a factor in school selection we worked hard to prioritize including women in all of our activities. From decision making to training to employment, we tried to improve some aspects of physical accessibility, such as retrofitting buildings with access ramps whenever possible. And we made sure that the project had comprehensive safeguarding policies covering both on and off construction sites. However, as you know, uh, the Nepal Safer Schools project is a DRR project that saw a massive real-time emergency, which we're all uh, affected by, uh, which is not always the case, thank goodness. And unfortunately, this was one that frankly, basically no one in the world was prepared for. The project did pivot to be part of the COVID-19 response, uh, especially uh, including accessible wash infrastructure, distance learning support, psychosocial first aid training for teachers, and prioritizing employing those in communities whose livelihoods had suffered the most because of the pandemic. The ongoing impacts of this pandemic are going to be far reaching and complicated. And alongside this is the rapidly increasing frequency of climate change related disasters. Not only were the communities and our field teams trying to cope through a pandemic, but in each year of this project, we have seen the increasingly devastating impacts of the monsoon season, for instance, which also put lives at risk across Nepal. Hey, but I say we'll do that how? Mm. As you may know, the NSSP is ending early. However, we thought this would be a good opportunity to reflect on some of the things that we have learned during the pandemic and any priorities it may have pushed to the fore when it comes to schools and students, such as the importance of investment in preparing for emergency distance learning, the increases in protection needs, 
and the need for strategies to address increases in both the number and the level of need of the most vulnerable. This is the final day in our NSSP Learning Week, and one where I know we have a strong panel of expert speakers, and I'm really looking forward to the meaningful discussion that I'm sure we're going to have. So back to you, Kanchan. Thank you. Thanks, Leela, for setting the stage um, very nicely. Now, today, before we dive into the panel discussion, uh, I would like to welcome you to uh, see a short video showing off some of the work done under the Nepal Safer School project. Um, so, Amy, may I invite you to project the video? Thank you. How can schools be safe, inclusive spaces for everyone? A space can only be safe if it allows everyone to participate equitably and thrive regardless of their gender, ethnicity, economic background, and level of ability. If there is anything in the way a school is set up or operates that deepens inequality, discrimination, or marginalization, it can never truly be considered safe. The Nepal Safer Schools Project made sure that gender, equity, and social inclusion, and the universal value of leave no one behind was central to programmatic design. We prioritized supporting teachers in implementing Jesse practices, and encouraged women to take part in Mason training and upskill on NSSP job sites. अब त्यो बाटो भने हामीलाई ढुक्क भएको छ सिप पनि सिकेका छौं काम पनि पाएका छौं वि रेट्रोफिटेड स्कुल बिल्डिंग्स विथ द इन्क्लुजन अफ एक्सेस रेम्प्स फर पीपल विथ डिसेबिलिटीज अपाङ्गता मैत्री शौचालय थिएन बालबालिकालाई अपाङ्गता मैत्री बाल मैत्री शौचालय चाहिँदो रहेछ त्यहाँ जोखिम देखियो अनि यहाँ ढिकढाकहरु थियो रेलिङ थिएन र्याम्पहरु थिएन बालबालिका उसितिने लड्ने जोखिमहरु थियो त्यहाँ हामीले भेटायौं and work with schools to create mechanisms that are responsive to complaints, including about harassment or abuse. We have to do this in the first place. We have to do this in the first place. We have to do this in the first place. We have to do this in the first place. We have to do this in the first place. We have to do this in the first place. We have to do this in the first place. As the devastating effects of COVID-19 were felt across Nepal and the world, the Nepal Safer Schools Project and the schools it was working with were also heavily impacted. All 17 municipalities NSSP worked with approached the project to explore ways to support schools and students through the crisis. with hygiene of utmost importance, the project helped build child, gender, and disability-friendly hand-washing stations and toilets, and supplied items like soap and cleaning products to help mitigate the spread of the virus in schools when they began to reopen. The project also contributed to distance education efforts, including broadcasts of radio classes and printing of home study materials. To help identify and respond to students and other school members in crisis, the Nepal Safer Schools Project trained more than 160 teachers in psychosocial first aid. Dilia Samandi ko abo mano parampara marsa gariyo jab jab ki engata sal ko bhi thele gada hari bal bali karu ali samasya dekhe ga thiye. Waha rulai chahi anusandan garera mano paramarsa dera ya maile pani gari. And when construction was able to resume with COVID-19 protocols in place, masons and laborers from the most vulnerable backgrounds were prioritized for work opportunities. I am a very poor person. I am a very poor person. I am a very poor person. I am a very poor The pandemic has fundamentally changed our understanding of what disasters can look like 
and how we need to boost schools' resilience to catastrophic events in the future. Thank you, Amy, for that wonderful video and showcasing what the Nepal Safe School Project has been doing in response to the pandemic, really setting the stage for today's discussion as well. Now, as we move on to the panel discussion, we are very honored to have our experienced panelists who have a deep experience in school safety and we're pleased that they're able to join us today. Our broad three questions for the panel discussion today are um, talking about uh, experiences of DRR efforts put in place prior to pandemic that proved useful in helping school communities respond to COVID-19, you know, what are some of these examples? And while all children studying in Nepal have been impacted by the pandemic, what particular trends do we see in increasing vulnerability and protection needs? And where are efforts best focused to ensure that the worst affected are not left behind when schools can fully resume? The third question for the panel discussion is, what does the future hold for Nepal's young students worst affected by the pandemic? And what lessons about preparedness can we take forward to lessen the impact of school closures in future catastrophic events? Um, so just taking a minute to um, you know, uh, look at these questions, I will introduce our first panelist today, uh, Mr. Ian Atfield. Ian Atfield is the Regional Education Advisor for Girls Education Challenge in South Asia at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He works to enable government and local partner buy-in and scaling best practices from both Girl Education Challenge and wider education reforms and innovation. Previously, Ian has worked in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and Tanzania, developing and overseeing education programs. He has worked extensively on wide range of diverse education instruments and engaged in formulating education policy around inclusive education, teaching and learning and non-state provisions. Ian has a disability and understands firsthand the issues on inclusion, inclusion and data related to disability. Welcome Ian. Um, thank you so much for joining today. May I welcome you now for your presentation and remarks you have eight minutes, and I will let you know when your seven minutes are up. Thank you, Ian. Great, thanks a lot. And um, and, and as you heard at the end of the um, my intro, uh, given that I have a, a mobility disability myself, it's really great to see on the video and, and learn about some of the inclusion work and the um, disability-friendly uh, infrastructure um, that the NSSP have provided. Um, I'm going to focus today in the time allotted um, to try to give some examples from one of the um, UK's other main education work in, in Nepal, the Girls' Education Challenge, pulling out two examples and really looking at how, how they have responded to, to COVID and the, and the, and the, um, and, and the pandemic and the extent to which um, their sort of work on disaster resilience has has helped to to be able to inform and and support their response. Um, so first, the STEM uh, program were operating in the far west of Nepal in in Kalali, and then secondly, a couple about the street child Nepal. So, and apologies for the typo, um, um, which operates in 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 province two with the um, Musaha uh, Dalit community. Next slide, please. So the, um, this slide basically summarizes um, some of the assessments that were done, not in the first, but the second round. So you know, given how long we've had these, these issues um, with COVID lockdowns and then reintroducing, um, the first thing I, I guess I would stress is that the ability to reach out and communicate directly with students, parents, and communities using a mix of methods, um, phone, email, uh, if, if, if feasible, um, local visits from local actors is, is incredibly important. And, and I think that as you can see from the large stack diagram on the right, 
psychosocial impact, which I, I know has come up and will keep on coming up, has been one of the huge things to emerge. Whilst the health risks of actually catching COVID and its, the, the, its illness has obviously caused a great deal of distress, and, and of course the irony is that for young people they're most rarely affected directly by the symptoms. Of course, elderly family members are are prone, of course, but the psychological stress and fear um, seemed to override. Um, and certainly, in initial periods, I think the disseminating the, the you know the hand washing, the, the the face mask type interventions was useful. But it seems that in the long term psychosocial stress and uncertainty. Um, a lot of the girls in this program were, work, were just about to take their grade 10 exams and they suffer terrible anxiety about just not knowing whether this highly important exam to their lifelong potential was going to take place or not. And that wasn't the, obviously the, the intention of the lockdowns and the measures put in place, but it was unintended. And so um, we'll see about things that they did um, around that. Uh, we're going to be hearing a lot more about the sad truth of increasing gender-based violence and suicides, I'm sure, from the next panellist, um, Suraj, from TPO. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of adaptions, I, I mean, I would stress that these were possible partly because the programme had a very strong modus operandi. It had, you know, good, good information, good contacts. Um, maintain strong, you know, lists of phone numbers of individuals, uh, and it had also sort of youth representatives as well as teacher, school and local government and community representatives. Um, you can see on this uh, a range of um, interventions that were used, some of it to try to alleviate some of the psych and provide psychosocial support, increased use of radio um, through the network of community FM radios, uh, in addition to providing some sort of light touch um, refresher on, on learning for those students who were coming up to grade eight and grade 10 exams. Um, there has been various experiments with mobile phones, but one experience I think from the pandemic has been that the number of people able to access learning on phones is limited obviously more to richer families, urban areas, uh, and also there's more reluctance to allow adolescent girls to have free use of smartphones because of fears that might exist in their parents or family about how they may use it. And that's one of the, what we call gender, gender divides, not just the digital divide. Next slide, please. Um, we put on a month ago this event in conjunction with the bank and USAID, which was really to try to sort of answer, I think, the second question um, posed to us, which was about Friends on vulnerability, what's been the effect and, and who are being left behind when schools resume. Because I think that we're, we've been really keen to work with government and we had this event with government and three uh, initiatives were showcased about trying to, to learn and understand the extent of learning loss and how the effect is differential. Um, the full video from this uh, event is available in the World Bank website and on the Facebook learning to, um, page um, and is really worth a look. There's some great material. I'm going to focus on one of the three presentations done by um, one of the other Girls Education Challenge programmes, um, Marginalise No More. Um, next slide, please. Um, as flagged at the start, I mean, you know, when we think about the most vulnerable it's clearly poorest girls, those coming from the most marginalised communities, and you don't get more marginalised than the Musaha uh, Dalit group in, in, that, that live in, in many of the Terai areas. This programme has been working with the, the Musaha community for several years with UK aid funding and through the Girls Education Challenge. Um, and in a sense, what this programme did was that they introduced uh, a very useful set of sort of um, both small group learning, where they were in a sense working, as you can see in the picture, to try to enable girls to learn face to face through home visits. Uh, and then they, but then they also backed this up with phone based um, learning events. Now, clearly, um, other examples in the workshop showed how to do this uh, with schools, with something that was run by um, Teach for Nepal. Um, 
and other uh, organizations which the World Bank backed a, a 10 local governments trial. So that was able to show that some of these techniques about checking up on learning, uh, asking questions via mobile phone, um, you know, have been done by, by teachers as well as um, NGO uh, community education workers. Next slide. Um, so this gives a very simple um, how, how the distance teaching and learning work uh, operated using community focal points. And again, if you don't have these set up, you know, you don't may, may not know what you would use them for, but having strong community networks enables you to do these sorts of initiatives of things if you do face a, a disaster of any type. Um, again, on psychosocial support, they did well-being weekly check-ins both through phones and sometimes direct contacts with family. They initiated learning with a sort of 45 minute direct phone based session. And it is possible to do this as we'll see from the results on the next slide. And also to provide um, printed workshops, uh, worksheets and things that can be worked on offline. I think printed materials offline has been the biggest savior of learning through the pandemic, just because it's it's the lowest common den denominator and it's much more simple to, to, to roll out than some of the more complex online learning uh, opportunities, which we see more often in urban and better resourced environments. Um, on the next slide, please, um, you'll see some of the uh, learning and yeah, outcomes yeah. from us. <laughs> yeah, great, um, almost got, got through. And, and this really sort of shows that you'll, you'll see the sort of before and after bars on the right but you'll see for seven th several thousand of the most marginalized girls even using that remote phone-based intervention it is possible to increase core numeracy and lit literacy tasks um, we, we don't have time to go through the de details and we'll hear more about tpo's interventions so i won't focus those but i think it's important to be aware that even when schools are closed or, or learning centers are closed it's possible to stay in touch and keep learning going. Uh, the, the, the key question moving forward is how do we scale these, uh, embed them more closely in government interventions and school system. Final slide. So I'd like to finish just with a couple of general reflections um, on the initial response. It's keeping in touch with all of our actors and using our initial, um, um, you know, response trees. Uh, and, and that strength of our relationships, strength of community volunteers. Uh, we use uh, big sisters who graduated from our programs in, in some of our opportunities. How to use tech and communications is clearly a, a, a comparative advantage that we're building on. Um, we need to innovate and iterate quickly about what is actually working to the circumstances that we can't predict. Um, we need to keep that very strong marginalization and Jesse focus, knowing that girls and poor groups face the most risks if they can't afford to eat they need to go out they may need to drop out of school marry and they may lose interest um, and finally I would say that we've got all these different unpredictable types of disasters Nepal has its seasonal floods landslides that we're all aware of but in addition to light you know we've now seen a once in a hundred year massive earthquake we're seeing COVID um, we're currently dealing uh, in, in the region with this completely unexpected rapid takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, which is far, you know, reaching consequences. Um, to summarise, it's our resilience and people, which I think is the key way that we can respond. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ian. And thank you for that great summary at the end as well. Um, I think your presentation, particularly with data showing how interventions at this critical time um, can provide you can be very useful, particularly such as distance teaching and learning and home visits and follow up uh, by phone calls. And also to keep in mind the gender and digital divide that we see um, in the society and how it comes to play out uh, in this context. So thank you so much for your presentation um, and requesting all the participants to put their uh, introduction, introduce yourself in the chat box as well as put your questions and comments. Uh, we'll take them at the end of the three panel discussions, but please feel free to put them in the chat box now. Uh, now we move on to our second panelist today, Mr. Suraj Koirala. 
He is the technical advisor at the Transcultural Psychosocial Organization in Nepal, TPO. He's also the managing director of TPO Alliance, council member and Asia representative at the International Rehabilitation Council of Torture Victims. He has more than 15 years of experience in mental health and psychosocial support programs and research in Nepal. He has contributed in several national and international initiatives on mental health promotion and advocacy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Koirala, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Now I invite you for your remarks um, on this panel today. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kanchanji, and thank you so much uh, for giving this opportunity for me. Uh, I, um, I will um, give a little bit uh, a glance, you know, how uh, the psychosocial and mental health uh, concerns has been taken care of during the context of COVID-19 in Nepal. And the presentation of Ian really made me very easy in, 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 in fact, you know, giving the, the overall uh, uh, situation of, of mental health and psychosocial, especially with the girls and the children. Well, um, the major, uh, you know, the mental health and psychosocial uh, problem is also uh, uh, known as a major public health concern and disaster, especially, you know, the affected communities, like, you know, the mainly the children, women and the elderly are more likely to be vulnerable. And one of the online survey that TP Nepal has conducted in 2020, that showed also, you know, that the workload actually increased a lot with the, for the women, and that also increased the risk of violence to the children. So, Nepal faces number of emergencies every year, but have very limited response mechanism on mental health and psychosocial service that we all know about that. Well, um, it, despite all this, uh, you know, the fact uh, there have some initiations uh, taken uh, from the government and also from the civil society organization working in this field, especially in 2007, uh, there was, uh, you know, the IAC, the Interagency Standing Committee guideline that was translated and adopted in Nepal's context. And psychological first aid was developed first time in uh, 2008. In fact, that was the really start working for the, you know, the in, in a disaster affected community and integrating mental health into the action. And the government, they have recent, recently developed national mental health and psycho, mental health strategy and action plan that has gives uh, uh, some program uh, and, and planning, especially for the, you know, the mental health and psychosocial in the emergencies. Uh, and we have cluster based efforts already in place in Nepal and the mental health has been taken care by, you know, the health cluster uh, where we have mental health subcluster within that and the psychosocial subcluster under the protection cluster. So we all know there are a number of NGOs directly involved in the immediate and intermediate mental health and psychosocial response. So this is the general background um, of, of, of the, you know, the mental health and psychosocial in the, in the perspectives of Nepal. So in terms of COVID, uh, both clusters, as I say, like mental health subclusters and psychosocial subclusters, they were activated and regular meetings still has been going on. And um, there's a number of initiations for the health education and protection system in general has been done. Uh, and the, the training to the healthcare providers, teachers and NGOs workers also provided. And a number of you know, the agencies, including government, in fact, you know, they established and, uh, the virtual uh, uh, method of providing uh, the services uh, from the distance. So that is uh, what uh, the general scenario we have currently. So what TPO we actually did um, in terms of, you know, the TPO, uh, in terms of responding on, on, on this, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it has, you know, that we um, uh, adopted and developed several uh, guidelines and also the international standards tools that we have adopted in the context of Nepal to be working in the in, in, in this pandemic, but this is all. This is new for all uh, every one of us. Like you know, uh, we uh, don't know. We we were not aware how to work in this very difficult situation because psychosocial and mental health uh, itself is you know it's needed a lot of you know the uh, uh, contacts attentions uh, to, to to be provided the services. But you know the doing from the virtual way is 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 already very new for us. So that's why we actually developed some 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 policies some programs and we had. Uh, 
uh, few kind of, you know, the basic psychosocial skills guide was developed or also, you know, the translated Nepali language. Uh, we also had some other, so many other tools that I can, uh, maybe, you know, there's the time is too short, but, you know, there's the, that we have done. The second thing is, you know, uh, radio jingles and short PSAs documentaries were developed. Um, webinars, especially focusing on the uh, children, uh, mothers, uh, uh, pregnant and lactating mothers and other vulnerable groups was, you know, the organized uh, city of webinars were organized. Um, uh, we also contributed uh, to Ministry of Health and Population in terms of developing the COVID-19 mental health and psychosocial preparedness and preparedness and response framework. And uh, there's also the establishment of suicide helpline number in collaboration with Ministry of Health and Population and Mental Hospital um, uh, is in, in pattern that was that has already been in operation. Though there's also the study conducted on um, you know the, the tendency of suicide during the pandemic in Nepal. So that these are some of the initiation that has been done. And uh, the program together with ne Nepal uh, uh, safe, safe school uh, projects. Um, that we, what we have done is like, you know, there are a number of, you know, the activities that we have conducted. We have provided training to the teachers. We train more than, you know, the 110 teachers on basic psychosocial overview, psychological first aid, stress management. We also train more than 50 head teachers uh, on, on how to introduce mental health and psychosocial in their school. Because once the teachers are trained, they also have to be somehow supported by the administration in order to, you know, the uh, 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 delivering the services uh, in their schools. And after consulting with the teachers and also having some, you know, uh, uh, some some um, uh, uh, consultation with the children's uh, uh, referred by the teachers, we we were known like there is a common issues of the children, like you know that they were feeling very much loneliness. They were also feeling they had also kind of fear of being infected and uh, from this virus and also being dead. And that's a, that's the huge fear uh, with them. Uh, and you know because of this prolonged lockdown, there's a huge and extreme poverty in the family, and that also had a lot of impact in the in the children's you know the uh, 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 no, uh, children's life in at home there's a domestic violence increase uh, number of you know the evidence also showed like you know the because of this pandemic and all this sort of you know the crisis the domestic violence was violence was increased that has also a lot of you know the psychological impact to the children and another one is like you know the number of schools and you know the academic institution they have started online classes and many children they were demanding for the mobile for the you know the laptops for all these sort of devices and that was a little bit you know the very much uh, a little bit difficult for the parents to or to manage all those sort of things and we also found um, a few children they have shown uh, develop their aggression uh, because of you know that their 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 huge isolation from their friends from their pre peers and uh, some of them also told about you know the they were thinking about the self harm so these are some of the common problems that we have identified while you know the working while talking with the teachers while while uh, you know the uh, dealing some of the cases related to the psychosocial problems with the children so for that, what we have done was, you know, we provided training to the teachers and on basic psychosocial overview, head teacher, as I said. And another things what we have done, uh, the innovation is we developed a, a, a tools called community informant detection tool. Actually, this tool is already be, already developed in our in our previous project and has been used by several, you know, the agencies in Nepal and also in outside the country. This is actually for for to identify. And you know the detect the, the the problem of psychosocials among the children, and to refer you know what are the symptoms that uh, related to the psychosocial problem. That is a little bit difficult for the children to identify at the beginning. So that's why we you know the. Uh, Develop that tool, and we train teachers uh, uh, for 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 a couple of days. Like you know, we train them uh, how to use that community information detection tool. And there was four different you know the follow up meeting and um, uh, uh, were also conducted. And uh, after all this, you know, the uh, developing these tools, having uh, 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 psychosocial training, and all these sort of things, we were able to. Uh, uh, found around more than 100 children been referred by the teachers to our psychosocial counselors and some of these children are still getting psychosocial services from our you know the uh, 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 from our from our office so so this is uh, this is the the, the 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 work actually we have done so it is really interesting in terms of you know the working with the children the virtual itself is a new 
for everyone, including us and also the you know the uh, 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 teachers and 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 other local communities. Um, and and then after you know the using the CIDT tools and you know the the getting the cases of, of uh, the problem the cases with psychosocial problems through this you know the process was was quite uh, a learning uh, process for every one of us. So uh, after reviewing uh, all, all, one more minute. Yeah, one sure. Minute. Yeah, I'll. I'll finish now within that time. Uh, after reviewing all this, you know, the uh, programs and approaches, uh, uh, we, we, we actually would like, I like to, you know, emphasize a couple of things is, you know, when uh, it ha disaster happens, we look after the psychosocial issues. I think that has to be integrated into the community health protection and the education system from the beginning. So that's why, you know, the, if something happened in the community, immediately we can mobilize those resources. So that is the, the, the key, you know, the way, uh, you know, the uh, uh, masses, uh, to be to be taken. Similarly, you know, we need to develop the capacity of frontline workers so that you know the children and the, you know the uh, adolescents they require a lot of attention and they they require a lot of different kind of skills to deal with these cases. So we need to have you know the, that human resources in place uh, uh, and that has to be done. And of course, uh, from the civil societies donors and also from the government side, the increase of program and resources is quite essential and has to be you know the in place. And and of, uh, for the children, adolescents, and the vulnerable groups, there should have some specific program not the blanket program will work uh, you know the all the time so that's why we need to think about some specific program program to be you know the launch with that with that particular group and another thing is you know that the last is is continue here and the follow up because once a slot of psychosocial intervention doesn't work so that's why we need to have the mechanism to provide the continue care and following of the you know the uh, uh, issues then we can gradually mitigate the problems uh, uh, related to the psychosocial and mental health uh, i will conclude here thank you so much uh, over to you kanjanaji thank you very much uh, suranji thank you for um you know listing out the the challenges that you have observed through your um, research studies and interactions and also some of the recommendations that you have provided today you discussed about the community detection tools and also you know how teachers became an integral part of uh, implementing some of these tools and you also talked about some of the capacity building needed for the frontline supporters and workers from the very beginning so that it does not uh, come at the end or right when the disaster hits. So thank you so much, Suraji. I understand that you have to leave uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so if there are any questions from uh, the participants, please do put it in the chat box. So we'll take them uh, quickly if possible. And uh, let's move on to the third panelist. And after that, Suraji, maybe I can uh, request for your any remarks before you leave. Uh, we're very lucky to have our third panelist today, uh, Helen Sherpa. Helen Sherpa is the country director for world education in Nepal. She has led the development of world education's early grade reading and math programs, as well as educational interventions for child laborers and children at risk in Nepal. Helen was involved in the management of CIVAG and USAID funded conflict mitigation program which reached more than 17,000 women in Western Nepal with literacy, financial literacy and in income generation interventions. She also had a key role in the development of the schools as zones of peace program. Welcome Helen. May I now invite you to uh, share your presentation? Hey, good afternoon everybody. And for those in other parts of the world, good morning, good evening. Um, so um, World Education has been working across a number of emergencies um, in Nepal from earthquakes, floods, landslides for many years. And currently we are doing a lot of work with um, con continuity of learning um, in different districts of the country using a number of different approaches. Uh, this is one photo yesterday from Rautahat where children are attending Tol Shiksha. So we have quite a um, range of experience to draw on and reflect on. Next slide. Um, so in terms of how we can draw on that past experience in the current situation, during the earthquake, um, we had been mainly dealing with smaller regional uh, uh, disasters in the past. And the earthquake really tested those structures as the sheer scale of it. We needed to do a lot more work at the central level and the, the coordination mechanisms were improved a great deal. And that's been useful during this pandemic. 
for example, in getting um, alternative learning materials and things developed quite quickly last year. Um, the experience of adapting and innovative and being flexible at the field level has also been very useful in uh, developing our responses. For example, in West Nepal, our partners used um, Tol Shiksha developing neighborhood education strategies to address learning losses during long school holiday periods in the remote West. Those approaches have now been scaled up both across the hills and the Terai to address learning losses and to help children gather in small groups using teachers, volunteers, uh, start project staff and parents. So this sort of using that local innovation then and adapting it has been very useful. Also the, the past experience has been useful in developing those learning packs and getting digitalization and digital access to learning materials happening quite quickly. So that's been very useful. The Comprehensive School Safety Master Plan is a relatively new document as we heard earlier in the week. And a lot of us have contributed to different parts of that. But we all know that still the focus is on school infrastructure. Everybody wants a new school building, better school buildings, safer buildings. Less effort goes into preparing for natural disasters. What we have found though, is by having those comprehensive school safety master plan and plans being put in place, it's helped us to do other COVID related uh, work such as putting wash facilities in schools, addressing social distancing, and the other kinds of soft issues such as the bullying, the gender-based violence and things that we've been working around. And we've been using um, both in our UNICEF supported work and our Safe to Learn supported work, using those comprehensive school safety guidelines to lay the foundation for the work around the COVID response. So in terms of the vulnerability trends and what we see as the need, we see an overall increasing trend um, in vulnerability and it's, it's exacerbating the existing inequality regardless of what that is. So we're seeing, for example, you know, students who have got language barriers or poverty barriers or children with disabilities that were already risk factors that these have become even more difficult, making them even more vulnerable, from the, especially from the poorest families. We've also done um, early grade reading and early grade math assessments in UNICEF supported districts and in Salahi. And we can see that the better students who are already on a, on a path to learning have managed to continue to learn and do reasonably well during this pandemic. But what we see is, is that there's a greater gap between them and the weaker students. And the weaker students have not been able to keep up in these conditions. We also see that in the Terai, we work with some very, very overcrowded classrooms where there are over a hundred students in those classrooms. And these are from very poor communities. So not only um, do they not have access to technology at home? Often their parents are illiterate and their teachers are simply not in a position to provide that outreach and support. So they're heavily reliant on NGO volunteers and motivators and other staff to try and support and fill that gap. Um, as has been mentioned by the two previous speakers, the most economically disadvantaged students, the pandemic is worsening their situation and their vulnerability. And what we can see is from the uh, work we're doing around child labor, that many of these families have lost their daily wage labor and the other work they relied on, and, are they, and they are becoming increasingly indebted. Um, this has huge risks for the future, because parents, and we can see from the child labor program that we have going, we have recorded 9,000 um, 9, children, working children um, across 45 parlikas. And we can see that there are far more children coming into the brick factories, moving into domestic servitude as a result of this pandemic, um, heavily because parents can't support them at home and because they're in, in, in increasing debt. Um, so the other group that's of concern is in the most remote communities. Um, with WFP and UNICEF, we work across, uh, I think it's, I forget now, about 2000 schools in the remote mountain regions of West Nepal. 
these communities do not have access to radio, television, internet, or any of these. And there's been a slower provision of alternative learning materials. Um, Mugu got its first textbooks for the year just this past week. So the, the access to special learning materials is very hard to arrange, uh, especially once the monsoon strikes. So they're even more disadvantaged, and this is increasing the gap between those with access and those without. A lot of children did not enroll last year that normally would have enrolled and attended, and other children have dropped out. And with schools opening and closing, we have a concern that many of these children may never never join school or never come back to school if they've already dropped out. So these are going to be huge issues going forward. Excellent. So looking ahead and the impacts we'll see on children, these impacts will linger for years to come and we should expect that there will set, be setbacks on Nepal's education achievements that have been made over the past decades. We also need to think that learning loss is going to be the norm, not an exception to the rule. In the past, you know, we were looking at, at a percentage of children who were really struggling learners. But with so much instability and unequal access and long periods and breaks, we think that there's going to be a lot more learning losses. And we can already see this in our um, early grade reading and early grade math results. There will also be a lot more variability in classrooms with the, the better students and the gap and a much greater range of learning, which means that teachers are going to need a lot more support and skills to be able to cope and provide the remedial support that's needed. Um, teachers traditionally in Nepal teach to the grade level and teach to the textbook. With children with different learning outcomes during the pandemic, we're going to find it very difficult. They need to be able to assess the learning level and teach to the right level, not just keep teaching at grade level. And has been mentioned by both of the two previous speakers, we need to think about the psychosocial aspects of how those kids are coping, both during this pandemic and the economic fallout, the fallout within families. Um, this is going to be a long-term problem. We are working with the government in Nepal on NFE with equivalency, which will provide pathways for older children who are dropping out. And we really need to scale up that work. We're, far further, we're a long way behind other countries in providing these um, alternative learning options, but we need to have that as an option um, for those students who cannot continue for economic reasons or because of their age. So looking ahead, and you know, preparing for the next crisis. There will always be another crisis, there always is. Um, we do not know where, we hope there won't be any earthquakes or future pandemics, but even while we're in this current crisis, we need to think ahead for the future. The comprehensive school safety master plans can be a holistic approach that will ensure preparedness for different types of disruption, natural disasters, political crises, pandemics, earthquakes, these are all things that can be accommodated within those uh, school safety master plans. But while we're doing that, we should also be thinking about the complementarity and different options for learning. Within the traditional school setting, we need a lot more focus on building and using remedial teaching skills for teachers so that when there is a crisis, they can actually help students catch up and, and gain back those, those uh, losses of learning that they've had. We need to address wash better at all times. Uh, we've been doing a lot of wash during the, both the, earth, the previous earthquakes and now during COVID. And the reality is that there is not enough water in many of these schools. Even when we build beautiful wash facilities, uh, we don't have the water for providing Lynn, hand washing. You have less than a minute. Oh, this is my last slide. I'm nearly there. Um, and so we need to think about that. The COVID pandemic has also highlighted the issues of poor ventilation and overcrowded classrooms. And the inequity around um, having, a, having space within a classroom is most noticeable when you're in Terai schools and you're dealing with very, very overcrowded classrooms with more than 100 students. And we really need to address this as a priority. We also need to keep these emergency alternative learning options that have been developed 
continuing. We can't just drop them and when the next crisis comes around, try to revive them. We need to keep those internet, TV, digital platforms, radio lessons. We need to keep that skill and expertise alive and functioning. And we need good non-formal options that have equivalency so that students who've had to drop out can come back, catch up even after the immediate crisis and that we have those in place if there's stop and go type disasters like this one. So that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you, um, particularly talking about the trends in vulnerability that you discussed about how, um, you know, the gap between the students who are uh, doing well and students who are not doing well tend to increase, uh, particularly in this case during the pandemic. The trends of also children going into child labor uh, workforce and also the vulnerability of remote areas, uh, um, the challenges that they face are magnified even further. And towards the end, you also talked about how the comprehensive school safety master plan um, can cater to some of the challenges that we face during the pandemic if we are prepared well, if we focus on the traditional and the non-traditional approach. Um, so great examples and recommendations shared today. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, now, as we know, Suraji will be leaving soon. Um, so any questions, I see a few on the chat box. So I'd like to invite him next to reflect on any of the you know, presentations of the other panel members or the two questions that I see. Let me just read that out from Henry. He has said that the child labor is 15% about the second highest frequently reported nationwide and uh, interested to hear panelists thoughts on the links between livelihood and COVID. There is another one um, from Jemima on, you know, whether TPO has seen differences uh, between the mental health effects uh, after the earthquake or any other, um, you know, some of the frequent disasters like floods and differences with the impacts from COVID. There's also another one that from Roshan Chitrakar, whether the supply uh, and demand uh, also need to be strengthened for psychosocial support, whether stakeholders have become critically demanding of the services they're deemed important for them. So some of the comments coming up, Suraji, I give you the floor now. Yeah, sure. Sure, thank you, Kanchanji. And thank you so much for this very important question. And uh, of course, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, the, the, the trend of mental health and psychosocial in different disasters is always, uh, 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 always, uh, always the dynamics is, is a different. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to compare from one study to another study because after the earthquake, we have done, you know, the two different survey. And that was um, that, that the methodology that we use is a little bit different than the methodology we use this time. So, so that's why it is a little bit different, uh, difficult to compare. But of course, that they, we can we can we can share you about the trends. We have found around 30% people have either you know the depression or anxiety uh, after the earthquake uh, in in six earthquake affected districts. Um, um, but the but the but the overall situation at that time because it was affected in 14 districts only and a lot of you know the immediate support and response was provided from the government and and civil and and all you know the donors and 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 NGOs and that's why um, also we have we found in our you know the uh, follow up uh, visit and the research that was the hope was gradually increased and the resiliency of this of the people in the community actually was quite strong at that time. So now in our online survey, that showed that around 50% have at least one psychosocial problem because this time we haven't asked about this, you know, the, the disorder specific question is there is more psychosocial symptoms that we have asked uh, in the online survey. So we, we found around 50% have at least one psychosocial problem. And the trend is actually is quite, uh, 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 fearing is like, you know, is increasing in trend and, and, and all everybody is saying because of the, you know, the lack of having uh, the economic opportunity because the poverty economic opportunity have very much direct linked with the psychosocial well-being of the people. And the second thing is quite concerning for us is about increasing risk of suicide. 
and the self harm uh, in this you know the pandemic uh, uh, time if you see the data of nepal police the last year the nepali year like paisak jet osar that was quite high in terms of you know the uh, uh, the data of uh, of of the another another month so in, in that means like you know that was the peak time of the uh, first lockdown last year and that was you know the the huge uh, uh, impact on the on the suicide and 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 the self harm so that is one and the second question about generating is balancing both supply and demand of course I, I completely agree because when we have a system and response in place, that's equally we need to in, enhance uh, the, the 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 communities. You know the. Uh, 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 understanding and awareness but because you know the the psychosocial and mental health itself is quite uh, you know they stigmatize uh, and and people don't want to disclose their problems uh, towards uh, uh, towards others so that in that case you know we need to have a lot of mechanism to be in place in the community so that people will understand yes the psychosocial mental health problem is also as normal as like other problem and it is, it is easily accessible in our community and i can go and get uh, the services from there so that's kind of you know the mechanism we need to Develop and the CIDT, the the in, in this community information informant detection tool, was one of the key you know the uh, tools that we use actually to increase the demand from the community. That's and later on you know we we have the the, the supply from the health facilities and other resources in the community. So that's the balance approach is quite uh, uh, important in the context of mental health and psychosocial, especially in the countries like Nepal. Thank you. Thank you, Suranji. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Again, requesting participants to put their questions or remarks um, in the chat box. Uh, Suranji, um, thank you so much for joining us today. But if you have any other final uh, thoughts, uh, remarks before you have to leave, would you like to add anything else? Sure, sure. I, it's, it's really a great discussion uh, and, and the great panelists uh, we have. And thank you so much for giving uh, the opportunity for me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very sorry that I have to leave a little bit early. Uh, I have another meeting at four. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and giving this uh, floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kanchanji. Thank you again for your time. Um, so we have some questions coming up uh, in the chat box uh, requesting Helen and Ian to kindly take a look as well. And I will also read out some of the questions here. Uh, let me just see if I miss anything. Um, right. So for Ian, there's a question. Sorry. Uh, Helen, yes, you about I, 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 I've been... I've had time to read them, so so so, so let me just um, maybe just uh, um, give a couple of answers, and I'm sure Helen will correct me afterwards and and, and give a, a, a much larger and fuller response, um, given how much more experience Helen has um, in, in working in Nepal. Um, I mean, working down the chat, um, my my colleague Henry has has flagged the higher high rates of child labour reporting and, and impact. Uh, or links between this and child, child labour um, livelihoods during COVID and education. I mean, certainly given our focus with programmes on girls' education, there is, um, you know, some of our online surveys have, have shown certainly high rates of, of girls um, doing household chores, um, clearly some of the time that was formerly in school and also time that was spent doing Sort of social learning with other girls is now being taken up again by doing household chores. I don't think that was a particularly surprising finding and somewhat reflects um, gender norms um, or prevailing gender norms, I would say. Um, but I think that that sort of, you know, ability, that's one reason why anything that can promote learning continuity by children, even if they're studying at home and the acceptance um, by parents that this is right and appropriate is, is is very positive but clearly for the most um you know um, economically deprived families they may well feel those pressures to, to to seek employment um i don't think we fully understand yet the the impact of the loss of remittance work given you know both long-term migration of of uh, of of adults um predominantly men to um, to the Gulf and other countries, and also seasonal migration across to India. All of these have been disrupted in different ways because of COVID. And some of that may have also impacted 
the availability of local casual working communities. Uh, I mean, right, right around the world, it's not uncommon for teenagers to, to, to be involved in, in a certain amount of, of, of labour in, in reduced hours, but clearly at some point, and according to the international definitions, it becomes child labour and, and things which, which inhibit full development and education of the child. And that's something that we should be both looking at in depth and trying to avoid. The Sahar community. I think one thing that's really struck me with this programme with Street Child is that early on they had issues and then they came to a very positive resolution, NMS, which in a sense is, is the Musahar community's own um, awareness and self-help group. And I think that was incredibly useful um, to really um, try to address and scale the responses and to, to get them a, a voice in some of the wider local government and you know community work where the, some of those families for example were being excluded from some of the distribution of supply and emergency foods in the in the first um, um, in the first pandemic in 2020 um, so I think that you know, you know, clearly there are even still issues of exclusion between Musaha and other and other groups, Medesi groups. Um, you know, it is very, very complicated, and I don't pretend to have a very strong and functional knowledge of, of those issues. But I think that for sort of uh, urban, informal slum settlements like the Sukumbasi groups that, that that you mentioned, very much that's coming together and, and having. You know, a voice with, with local government with, um, to try to um, make sure that there are education opportunities it is really, really important. Um, finally, I, I think there was a, um, a question on um, from Anil Nupan about um, the government response and the government not being able to, you know, fully tackle issues of continuity of learning. I mean, at the moment, the new education sector plan that will be enforced in the next 10 years to replace the school sector development plan SSDP is, is, is the full you know there's a full draft approved um, I mean I think there's still lots of unresolved issues more broadly um, on the, the sort of federal transitions and for being able to fully empower and support the local governments to deploy education services and that includes being response to disasters and emergencies uh, uh, whether it be around the infrastructure that can be destroyed in natural disasters or, or annual flooding or some of the, the broader stuff such, such as teacher professional development and I would say that's a particular issue given the dissolution of, of many of the teacher training colleges it's not it's not and resource classes it's not clear now where a local government can get its expertise to support teacher professional development um, you know likewise water facilities I mean there's always that argument that, that having a, a good quality and plentiful supply of water at schools helps to encourage regular attendance in particular if water is is is, is not available easily in, in the dry season um, so I mean I don't think there's any one answer there but certainly the joint development partners uh, are getting behind the government in its new education sector plan. I think a key issue is resourcing and those both budget and roles of local government to take to spend their own resources but also to spend wisely on things that will have the most um, impact and certainly the, the event I mentioned um, earlier in my presentation is one of our attempts to sort of point out learning about learning continuity that can have a strong impact. Um, the question is, how do you roll these out at a bigger scale in the new decentralised federal report? Um, over to you, Helen. Okay, well, first on the issue of child labour, I mean, we've had huge child labour programmes for many years in Nepal, and we can see that the government of Nepal and communities have made a lot of progress in reducing child labour. And over this period of the pandemic um, in the communities, we're working with 45 municipalities. We can see that in the first wave, many of the most vulnerable families 
got some form of relief last year. With the second round of lockdowns and the second wave this year, no support whatsoever. And in work and case management with these children and their families, we've discovered that many of them are going into greater and greater debt. Now, for, the most, for those children who are already in, we're also seeing that more and more families are taking increasing num amounts of loan. And right now, those loans are not being called in. And so the number of children going into child labor is going to be an onward downward spiral. And can we reverse that? Can we stop that? That will be a big question. We need to make sure that when schools reopen, that the school meal program functions really well, because that's a huge incentive for these poorest families to get those kids back into school. So I think that it's going to be an ongoing problem and we can just see already children being sent to, to you know, domestic servitude, to bricks and things. And that's just, just the tip of the iceberg. We can see more and more, we expect more and more this coming brick season. And um, it's something that we need to be paying a lot of attention to. Um, another question here was on um, the um, children with disabilities and do we um, ha know what's happening to these children. Now, many of these children um, attend resource classes or special schools that are remote from their own home where they're in residential facilities. And when they go home, there's no one who understands um, sign language or how to help with braille. And these kids are then in a very difficult situation. We are using, um, uh, we are supporting uh, the teachers to be able to contact these families with mobile phones. We're mobilizing disabled persons organization volunteers and staff to try and support these children. But it's extremely challenging because these children are very scattered and um, their needs are not, not clearly supported already in many of these schools. So that's a, quite a big issue. And the last and final question you had for me was on how do you keep the attention going between disasters? Now, this is a huge problem and that, you know, people who work around emergency education, keeping up the enthusiasm, keeping this work going is very, very difficult. People get burned out from one disaster and then by the time the next one comes around, they've taken some other job, some other opportunity. And we do have... Uh, Pre-monsoon each year from the education cluster, we do have planning meetings where we try to get enthusiasm and get people doing monsoon preparedness. And I think that we need to really broaden the number of people involved and make use of technology using Zoom and involve more people from the parlikas, more people from civil society on those annual planning exercises so that there are people who are aware and take more responsibility, both from the parlikas, provincial and civil society, and not relying on a few people in Kathmandu to do this. And if you get through a year without any disasters, that's really great. But usually at the local level, somewhere in a province, there's going to be some sort of landslides or flooding or some sort of issue. So how we can do that, I think it needs to be built into the annual planning processes of the government every year and be something that we really support and push. The other thing that has worked is having donor support for a secretariat um, through the Schools of Zones of Peace Network. Um, there has been you know, support for a local organization to play a lead role for a number of years and then handing that over to another organization. And that is another way of ensuring some sort of continuity but it has to be supported. Um, there are, these organizations can't do this work without any financial assistance to pay for staff because it's heavily dependent on, on people doing and visiting and motivating people to make plans. So from my side, I think that's answered um, all the questions unless there was something else. Well, thank you, Helen and Ian. Thank you for also helping me go through the questions in the chat box. I think most of them in the chat box have been answered. I was just wondering, you know, uh, during the panel uh, presentations, we heard a lot about how teachers uh, role is expanding into learning how to teach in distance, uh, you know, education into psychosocial support. We also heard Suraji's, um, you know, uh, uh, thoughts around the community. 
uh, information detection tools. So teachers' roles are continuously expanding, whether you think that, you know, uh, uh, whether you think um, teachers are able to handle all these different roles as they go forward and like expand their skill set, or what kind of feedback are you hearing from teachers as we put a lot of um, you know responsibility on them to um, quickly adapt to these um, challenges that we see? I think that depends on how many students they have. Um, where we see teachers in the hills who have. 20, 30 students in a class, they are up for all of this. When we get to the Tarai, we have our worst case is 350 students for one teacher. We have 180, 160, 120. We have lists of these, these teachers. There's no way they can cope, even with 70 students to try and, which is the which is meant to be the norm for the Tarai. How do you provide all of that for all of those students? So I think it's very dependent on class size. And I think one of the first things we have to do is address the inequity in um, teacher distribution. We've been fighting this battle for many years. It's a lot better than it was, but we still have um, in the most needy communities, an unfair distribution of teachers, which needs, and, and there's always promises, but there's these things and the pandemics delayed some of that action again. So I think there's a willingness of teachers to do this and they can be trained and supported to do this, but they can't do it when they've got large classes. They just can't. There's just too much going on, too many children. Ian, I don't know what you think. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I built upon those comments and, and this is not a unique issue to Nepal or to the, you know, to, to our area of Nepal. There are um, inequities in, in teacher distribution. Um, I mean, I would flag that teachers' intrinsic motivation to be able to learn, to adapt, to do new tasks, say associated with, you know, teaching online, um, running a phone survey, you know, um, creating perhaps a, a simple uh, lesson plan that they can print and distribute to their students. Um, there has to be a strong motivation to do that. And as Helen points out, it's impossible to, to do that for 100 students, and you would likely feel very demotivated. Um, the whole system of, you know, the reforms that are currently underway to try to, um, to um, you know, there's been sort of giving these aptitude tests to Rahat teachers, um, how many teachers are on permanent contract, what is actually within their incentive, you know, what are they incentivized to do? Uh, un under the new local management, you know, previously, you know, there have been issues around politicisation of the teachers' workforce, depending on where jobs come. But clearly, there have been, a, you know, you know, a, you know, cases where a lot of teachers simply didn't know what to do and stopped working when a that their own lives were at risk from COVID, and we, we can obviously understand that. But also, there wasn't clear. Um, directive about what, what was expected of them. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a very multifaceted problem. I mean, I think that looking for solutions rather than focusing on negatives is, is a good thing. And there are a lot of positive experience from all over the world. Um, we don't have to look too far across the border, across Indi to India, for example, to see, say, the work of, of Pratham, you know, an India-wide NGO that does has experimented hugely with uh, learning camps, with um, volunteers, with teaching at the right level. You know, I mean, there's lots of good practice and ways that you can support learning. But I think that the the reality that so many students are behind their grade level, um, either before pandemic or it has become even more acute, that some of those skills about knowing where students are at and grouping them via ability and supporting them on, on that, in particular, the basic literacy, rather than just plowing through grade one, two, three, four, five, regardless of whether your students can catch up. I mean, those are some of the main lessons that are feature on, on the, in the sort of you know, global education debates. It's, it's what we, we sometimes call best buys or smart buys, which are you know, the things that are being promoted by the larger education donor community as things that are cheap to do because let's not forget the, the teacher salary workforce budget 
is is large and it's it's the major constraint uh, you know it's a major spend and remember a lot of that spend continued through the pandemic even when schools were closed N nobody wanted to threaten the livelihoods of teachers um, and, and their regular salaries um, but obviously that learning loss has happened and it, you know that we need to do all, all things possible to make t teaching and learning more effective looking looking forward thank you yeah Thanks, thanks, Helen and Ian, um, for your comments and remarks. Um, now we have a few more minutes, about 10 minutes uh, in the panel discussion. I just want to check in with the participants. If anybody would like to come in into the discussion, please raise your hand if you would like to speak uh, or just comment on what you've heard so far. Please also put your questions on the chat box. Uh, anybody would like to come in at this time? I don't see a hand raised. Uh, Amy, do you? No, I don't. Okay. Any other questions or comments at this point from the participants? Okay, I think uh, we benefited from having good discussion uh, with our panelists today. If there are no more questions, now I'm uh, moving towards uh, the final remarks from our panelists today, just reflecting on, on what has been said by you know, the other panelists and also the questions being raised. Would you like to share your final remarks? Helen, would you like to go first? Okay, I think that um, it's been an interesting week. There's a lot of um, focus and attention in comprehensive school safety on the safer buildings and I think that you've brought in that to discuss inclusion and other things which has been really useful. I think with the COVID pandemic issue this is a new one for us and it's across the whole country and I think we need to be very alert that the impacts are going to be very different in different communities and we are not able to predict where we'll see the greatest problems. It could be in urban areas um, for the people who live in the most um, marginal circumstances there. It may be that remote areas bounce back quicker because they have smaller class sizes. We really don't know. And I think we need to be very vigilant and keep tracking what's happening and be flexible and respond. We also need to be really conscious of this whole generation of kids who have had very interrupted schooling that are now going to be dropping out, joining the workforce, see that they're protected, see that we have alternative education options for them to finish and get qualifications and ongoing learning. So I think that there's a lot that we need to be thinking about in terms of uh, protecting their right to education. And I think that it's been very useful to have this discussion today and um, look forward to working with all of you in the future. So that's all, over to you, Anne. Thank you, Helen, thanks so much. Ian, would you like to go next? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly uh, re-emphasize Helen's comments here, in particular the first one is that you should expect the unexpected when it comes to disasters and resilience. And, you know, I mean, it almost seems that, that you know, that the God or the gods were, were, are playing with us when they throw a massive earthquake, which was a sort of, very much the basis backdrop for the last long-term education plan and just when that one's coming to an end something completely different happens um and certainly when i first saw the some of the work in nepal when i when i came here three uh, about three years ago on the comprehensive school safety plan you know it was that very much that emphasis on on infrastructure and and while of course nobody wants to get you know, crushed to death or experience a landslide. Um, the reality is that that must look quite difficult or different to, you know, you imagine that you're, you're a young girl who's being taunted and bullied and abused on the way to school or is, is suffering from um, maybe harassment by, by a teacher or another student within the school. Their, their view may be very different. And I think that really, you know, emphasizes why it's, it's important to very much look for that holistic picture about what what we mean 
I mean, I think it's always sometimes difficult to get the balance because I think that, you know, we point the point of doing disaster risk planning is to understand where the risks are, but also to accept that some of those risks will, will always be present, that you can take certain steps, that if you spend your whole life in, in fear and intimidation, you know, that, that that can also be counterproductive, which I think was perhaps some of the messages that came out from um, Suraj um, before he left and that, and that sort of, you know, you know, clearly the growth in awareness of the importance of mental health, uh, the benefits of, of psychosocial and very simple tactics to, to promote broader mental health for both individuals, communities and schools, I think is, is really important. That broad shift towards being, you know, inclusive, whether we go from the disability, the gender, uh, you know, the, the caste, social dimensions, I think these are all you know, will greatly increase our resilience. You know, if, if we live in a community which is riven by disputes at times of crisis, you expect people to come together and that is one of your best coping strategies. It's like a, you know, a, a, an informal form of insurance. And, that, and I think that, you know, that, that was really why my presentations, I, I, I certainly have a hypothesis that the communities and schools where some of the programs are working, and I'm sure it's likewise for world education, where you have those strengths because you've brought communities and schools closer together the school has to be perceived to be part of the community with lots of two-way communication information and that is one one way that you will come together more quickly and more effectively if there are uh, when they when or if the next is that it's a strong as uh, Ellen um, for, forewarned us the next disaster is just around the corner. Um, I, finally, I think I would say that I mean I was really pleased that the government of Nepal made some quite major commitments to increase their funding at the, the education summit that took place here in London last year. They uh, and these are embedded in, in the education sector, which for me is increasing me we'll see in the next few years this focus on more power, autonomy, and hopefully more capacity and depth within local governments who are accountable, you know, to, to their population through the mayor and the local government and ward structures. And so I think that the more that we can do to support that uh, and to show what is possible, because there's nothing, I think, more powerful than, you know, showing how well a certain local government or palika can do and to see what innovations come. That's you know what one of the expected benefits of of decentral decentralization we need to make sure that 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 can be done right across all aspects of education and i think there's clearly responsibility on all of us central actors to try to make that a reality thank you thanks ian thanks helen thank you so much panelists for your thoughtful remarks and presentations today i think it has really complemented the whole uh, learning week sessions and it has also reiterated some of the key points coming out from the previous sessions. I think today, particularly looking at, um, you know, the holistic picture of the, the education of the children and how it is at risk uh, now, definitely as they go back into um, the school system, the education that they receive, the quality of it becomes, uh, you know, very important that we focus on them from various angles, not just uh, infrastructure or you know certain aspects of it, but also their learning environment and the mental health of their communities and families as well. Um, so thanks for very much for sharing your perspectives today. Now we're coming to the end of today's discussion, and uh, it has been wonderful to hear your thoughts. Now I invite Leela once again to provide our closing remarks and uh, over to you Leela. Thanks everyone uh, for your support and participation. Thanks to the panelists and the organizers. I hand it over to you Leela. Thanks so much Kanchan. Um, on behalf of NSSP, which is a consortium comprised of Crown Agents and Set Save the Children in Harup, I really want to thank everybody for participating today. Uh, and asking a lot of important questions um, that needed to be talked about. It was really a great discussion and I, I am so grateful uh, that everybody was in to participate. 
I especially uh, want to thank our government counterparts uh, who took time to participate over the course of the week. I know they're all very busy uh, and it's hard to sometimes make time to do these things. So it was great to get their perspectives. Uh, as for our panelists, Ian, Helen, and Suraj, uh, we were very, very lucky to have you. Thank you for uh, the great presentations, for the discussion, for answering questions, um, and for being involved in this work. Uh, this is the last day of our, of our learning week. It's been a great week. Um, a couple of people have worked very hard to put it all together. Kanchan, you've been really super. Thanks for everything. Um, it's just been wonderful working with you. Uh, Amy and Jemima, I don't know, the technical stuff on this was very complicated and you did a great job managing it across, I don't know, many time zones and it was very complex. So thank you for that. Uh, and of course, FCDO, uh, thank you for the support um, for this project. It was, it was, it's really been a pleasure to work on it. Um, and as team leader, I think that it's just, I, I can honestly say this is, this is a really great wrap up. Um, to the project. Uh, and I hope that the important work which was started uh, will continue. And I can see from all this discussion that at least parts of it are going to go forward with a lot of enthusiasm. So thanks so much. <laughs>